Hello and welcome to News Click. I'm Paranjoy Guha Thakurta and with me is James Crabtree. James has recently authored a book. This is the book. It's come out. It's called The Billionaire Raj and the subtitle is A Journey Through India's New Gilded Age. James Crabtree used to work with the Financial Times here in India for five years. He was based in Mumbai. Now he's an associate professor at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy in Singapore. He's a journalist whose writings have appeared in The Wired, Foreign Policy and The Economist, among other publications. Thank you so much, James, for Thank giving me this time. Uh, the first question, the easiest question. I mean, what <laughs> really sort of what really motivated you to write this book? I mean, as the correspondent of Financial Times in India, you had some of India's richest men willing to open their doors to you. And and what really spurred you to contrast their lifestyles with the lifestyles of or with the way large numbers of Indians live. And uh, in your book, there's a l huge amount of anger and outrage at the growing inequalities of this country. So uh, what really motivated you and prompted you to write this book? Well, two things. I turned up in India uh, in 2011. Uh, I'd never been, well, I'd been here before, but I never lived here before. And, and so if you think about it, I'm a journalist. I grew up in Scotland. I went to university in London. I, to the extent that I knew businesses, they were fairly tame, listed American and British businesses. And I turned up in Mumbai and suddenly you had these entirely different creatures, the sort of which have never been seen in, my, in the West or they've not been seen for a hundred years or more. Buccaneering tycoons who sit on top of enormous conglomerates who have huge amounts of power and just at the time that I was arriving were making unprecedented amounts of money and I was captivated by this side of India's business culture because it's quite unlike anything that we have in the West. Add that together with the fact that I, I learned quite quickly that India was going through a massive transformation. Typically the story that we tell about India's change is the one that begins in 1991 when the uh, political reforms happened. But really the change that came over economic India, reforms economic in reforms yeah. in 1991 when the country was reopened after 40 years of socialism. Well, what, what we describe as the era of economic liberalization. Correct. And so that was the moment the liberalization began. But the real change in India happened in the middle of the 2000s. And it is a change that is wrapped up in a far more global story. This was the period of enormous booming global growth, the height of China's expansion, and India also re-globalized at that time. Money flooded in from abroad. The tycoon class began to do things that they'd never done before in their history. That's partly to do with industrial investment in terms of what they were building for their businesses, but it was also to do with conspicuous consumption and what they were building and, for and, themselves. And, and inequality is widening in the process. We, yeah, so over this period, I think the evidence is unarguable that Indian inequality has uh, raced away. Now, it's a perplexing figure because on the one hand, uh, India has a very good record or a much better record than it's given credit for of reducing absolute poverty. Now, if hundreds of millions of people have been reduced, uh, have been taken out of poverty. But I think it's, to my mind, undeniable that the proceeds of the growth that have come, particularly since the mid 2000s, have gone overwhelmingly to the top. Oh, so okay. everyone is doing better, but the top is doing relatively better. Much, much better. And the, 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 you know, the, the business owners are doing best of all. Okay. James, you know, the American author Mark Twain, he was, to the best of my knowledge, described the late 19th century in America as the Gilded Age. He, he meant, he, he described a period where on the surface everything appeared to be glittering like gold. But beneath the surface there was filth and corruption. And the crass commercialization of the kind that, that combined with brazen corruption in public life. So you had economic growth, but it was fueled by the nexus between corrupt business persons and corrupt politicians and this and the so-called robber barons you know I mean I mean their their household names whether it be Rockefeller or Carnegie or Vanderbilt or Stanford or JP Morgan this was uh, the the sort of group of people who prospered now why did you choose to 
title or the subtitle of your book, India's New Gilded Age. Why did you opt for the American analogy when you talked about India's new gilded age and not uh, use the analogy of Russia or China? I think all three of those three big emerging economies, China, Russia and India, have a similar sort of story that they all had uh, a left-wing economy that opened up very quickly for different reasons. And so a lot of the same things are visible. There is great, There was great corruption. There was a kind of land grab for resources. Actually, compared to the China and Russia, India is probably the most benign of the three, although the corruption that emerged in the mid-2000s was severe. But I think the, the analogy with America, so you have to start by saying these two cases are very different. The countries are, are very different. And so it's a, it's a sort of metaphor. But you have a lot of things going on in India that and, are... And, and uh, the, the, in terms of time, there's more than a century. Right. Yeah, but then you have a lot of things that are similar. This is the, a period of early industrialization that a lot of countries have gone through. All other countries in East Asia, South Korea, for instance, have been through the same period. You have very rapid urbanization, an agrarian economy becoming an industrial economy. You have huge wealth creation at the top as you begin to move to an industrial and to some degree an industrial and exporting economy. You have the growth of an urban middle class. You have a huge infrastructure boom because this is the period in which you build, in America's case, railways and canals, and in India's case, toll roads and ports. Um, and you have the same phenomenon. The, 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 uh, in my book, I talk about there being three fault lines that India has to cope with, one of which is the super rich and the inequality that's come with it. Two is growing capitalism. And the third is a kind of boom and bust investment cycle, which comes from a very raw form of, of capitalism. And all three of those things were present in America's Gilded Age. You had the robber barons, as you said. You had really squalid urban politics, New York's Tammany Hall. But you also had a very unstable and unpredictable form of capitalism. You had the, the financial crisis of 1873, which was you know, at that time as definitional as the financial crisis that we had in 2007. And so while I don't think these things are the same, I think there's, there's an analogy there and it's almost, I mean, it's an optimistic one in some sense, because what it says about India is that if, as happened in America, you get policies right, it doesn't always have to be like this. You don't have to end up like Russia. Lots of countries, Britain, America, South Korea, to some degree, Thailand, Malaysia, have been through this period of buccaneering capitalism. And it's not set in stone that it has to be like that forever. Not everyone ends up like Russia as a sort of kleptocracy. You, you, you would argue that it's not just buccaneering capitalism. It, at times, it's like predatory capitalism because you talked about natural resources being appropriated, uh, the benefits of natural resources, the way they were allocated, the way they were priced, accruing to a privileged few rather than benefiting the majority. In India? Yes, India. Yeah. No, I mean, I think this is undeniably what happened for, from the mid-2000s again. So take a step back, what was happening in the world? This was just before the Beijing Olympics in China. It was the time of the great moderation, the high point of globalization. And so the world economy was doing well. Commodities were very valuable. And, and so there was suddenly a huge demand for things like iron ore licenses, coal mining licenses, second generation phones were suddenly very valuable as well. And so as India's economy grew, its kind of regulatory system was completely unable to cope with this rush of money that came through the system. And that meant that instead of having small corruption of the sort that, you know, you, you might have, your father's generation might have had where you have to bribe a policeman, big, ticket, big corruption. ticket corruption, retail corruption went wholesale. Um, and that's what happened, that's the third problem, you know, that, that in the end when people found out this was going on, then what had been a great boom then just ground to a halt all of a sudden because suddenly re people realized there was this squalid problem of corruption. And these are three problems. The reason why I highlight this is that there is a public narrative in India about economic reforms. But it's a very narrow narrative. It tends to be about, you know, what are we doing about the GST? Let, let, but but let the, point, the, point, the point being about these three fault lines are much bigger issues. In the end, the successful economies of East Asia, the ones who have made this, nav they've navigated the path from poverty to middle income status to being some of them rich economies, have grappled with these issues. You know, they were, there's plenty of inequality in East Asia, but much less than in India. They began to get a kind of handle on corruption and they found an investment model which didn't fall over as soon as you began to push it. And, and these are problems that whoever is India's next prime minister in, you know, after next year are going to have to grapple with this more seriously than has been the case okay. now. James, what I found particularly interesting and fascinating about your book are the anecdotes. 
Right. You know, I, I mean, I mean, you clearly had access to the rich and the super rich, and and your encounter or your meetings, whether it be with Vijay Malia in London or with the Ambani's or with Gautam Adani, I, I found that particularly interesting. In in fact, uh, what I found uh, particularly fascinating is the way you started your book about that unusual crash of that Aston Martin. Much of the Indian media just to completely black out this particular event, this, this very rather unusual development. And, and even today, much of the media in India is somewhat cautious in talking about, you know, that conspicuous consumption that you talk about, Antilla, that, that, that structure which you can't miss. So, so maybe you could tell us a little more about why you chose to start your book by talking about this car accident and the richest man in India who lives in this, I don't know, gilded palace, if you like. Well, so, I, I mean, Mukesh Ambani um, of Reliance Industries is the richest man in India. He's the richest man in Asia. And to the extent that I have been partly responsible for promoting this idea of oligarchs as opposed to oligarchs, he is clearly India's oligarch And, and as, you, as you quote somewhere in your book, he wants to be the richest man in the world. Yeah, I, I certainly have heard people who know him who think that that is his ultimate ambition. Um, and I suppose if India is going to grow for the next 20 years, then, you know, who knows? It's, he might, he's going to be there or thereabouts. He might just overtake the... Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's possible. Uh, Zuckerberg. Yeah, and, it's not impossible. But, uh, but he, A, he is... He is close to your platonic ideal of a buccaneering tycoon. He runs a distributed conglomerate which stretches from petrochemicals to telecoms and has hotels and media and all, all the rest of it. Um, he is a, perceived to be a very powerful figure. And then you have the house. Uh, and uh, so I'll come back to your specific question, but the house really stood for me as an icon of India's Gilded Age. If you think about America's Gilded Age, the buildings that represented it were the mansions of Fifth Avenue and then the hilltop homes you in Newport, You talked about Rhode Vanderbilt. Island. The, these, you know, the, 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 the most prominent buildings of an age tell you something about the spirit of that era. And Antilia is it's unique. Even in, in China, in America, even in Brazil, you know, the, these unprecedentedly unequal countries, there isn't a thing that somebody calls the billion dollar home. It is peculiar to India that you had this. It is an icon of this moment. I mean, and, and it almost, I mean, I lived in Mumbai for five years. It's a very, very unequal city. You, you come out of the airport, yeah, anyone you, can your, your, your cover shows that. I mean, but, you have the shanties, you have the people where people are barely surviving and against the backdrop. But the point about Antilia is that it was almost as if it was designed. It, you have a very unequal society, but it's almost as if this building was designed to add a whole new layer on top of that, where, uh, you know, an, another element of stratification. And so from the start, I was fascinated by, by him and his business, sort of what he did. He's obviously, in some senses, he's a very capable entrepreneur. He builds world-class oil refineries. But, but you could also good. argue that you, he's had a very, very favorable policy regime, in, including the way in which Geo has uh, expanded. And you could argue that the nexus between business and politics has been such, and it didn't start with Mukesh Ambani. It's, uh, it, it, it dates back quite a long time. He was able to expand and grow the way he did because of a favorable policy environment. The reason why I began with the Aston Martin story, so I, most of the people who are you will know this story, but in 2012-13, in uh, an Aston Martin that was owned by a Reliance Industries subsidiary crashed late night in Pedder Road in Mumbai. Uh, it's never been entirely clear who was driving the car. The company claimed that it was a driver that they own. Uh, there was a suspicion it might have been somebody else. Um, I, I, I like the picture you put and I and, and I found the car, the, 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 the wreck of the car. I happened to be doing some reporting on the story and I found it abandoned under a plastic sheet. And I used to, it became a kind of habit of mine. I'd go back to see if the car was still there. And, and finally, before you left, you found it had gone. Yeah, at one point it did disappear. But the point wasn't that what actually happened in that story remains a bit of a mystery. But what was perfectly clear was the perception of power amongst even the Mumbai elite. So this is not people who are powerless. These are bankers and other corporate uh, heads. They're senior journalists. These are people who are prosperous. And, but they felt, 
that the Ambani's had this mysterious power that they could, you know, make things disappear if they wanted to, that they could kind of bend things with their Superhumans. will. Superhumans. And, and so what that told me, what this story told me as I watched it, was, was it just told me the way that people think about the super rich in India, that they perceive, even if they, you know, reasonable people can disagree whether they do have these powers, but people think that they have them. Okay. And that's the point. All right. Now, you have in great detail talked about your interaction with Vijay Malia. We studied in school together, by the way. And also with Naveen Jindal, with Gautam Madani, you describe in great detail how you met them, the, the rides you took on their aircraft, and, and, and how Vijay Malia and said. So, I mean, if you, let's first talk about Vijay Malia. Do you think that he is being targeted, in a sense, that many other rich persons from India like him have borrowed huge amounts of money from the banks, not paid them, but that he kind of became, uh, to use his own language, a poster boy of what went wrong with yeah. this whole uh, big business taking loans from banks, evergreening them, and, and he was kind of targeted. And he would like to believe that he's more of a, more sinned against than a sinner, so to say. I think he's right about that, and I also think it's his own fault. So, Mr. Malia, for all of his you know, attributes and faults, he can't avoid attracting attention to himself. And so most of the rest of the tycoons who have found themselves in trouble, they borrowed too much money, some of it illicitly, they spent too much money, and then the music stopped, and they didn't have a chair to sit on. Um, and most of them were sensible. They just kept their heads down and they tried to sort of see what they could do to dig themselves out of it. But, but Malia kept attracting attention to himself. And therefore, he has become the poster child for corporate bad behavior. There are many people who did worse things than him. But because he's so flamboyant, because particularly because he left the country, there are elements to the... You know, he has always been a wonderful story. And that's why I think he's one of the most compelling characters in the book. I yeah, was delighted I mean, I mean, to go and yeah, spend I mean, time he's, with he's him. Such a let, colorful, me, let, me, let me say this. This is, this is the point. The point, I think, is that there is a risk that India thinks it has a Vijay Malia problem, not that it has a far broader corporate debt problem. And, and that a growing line, capitalism right, problem. Lying behind, it, it isn't, Vijay Malia is not the worst offender. Uh, he, I think many of the allegations to, that have been made against him to the extent that I have been able to understand them are not convincing. Um, some of the things that he is accused of having done, maybe, but certainly no, this is not proven. And I, you know, I, I think that that he has a kind of case that a lot of the stuff that people say that he's done, he didn't do. Um, now, that's not to excuse him many of his problems, uh, and he's brought a lot of this on himself. But I, I can understand why he feels like uh, you know that he's getting kind of singled out. And it means that there are a whole bunch of other less glamorous uh, tycoons who did equal or worse, who nobody ever hears about. And that's a big problem because it means that the perception is if you just bring back PJ Malia from London, we'll have solved this problem. And that is nowhere okay. near you made getting the point. to you made closing point. the problem. Let's talk a little bit about your meeting with Gautam Adani. Uh, first, thank you. Uh, I'm flattered by your remarks about me and your meeting with me in your book. But here was Gautam Adani who almost nobody knew 20 years ago or 15 years ago. And today he's not just one of uh, India's richest men. He's uh, running a major conglomerate, which is in all kinds of, uh, from electricity to coal mining, to imports of coal, to um, apples, edible oils. Apples. Uh, Isn't he the largest estate? apple producer in India? I think, I think you apple, told me that. Apple importer. Apple importer, right, there we are. Right. And He's now going to make drones uh, with the help of an uh, Israel, Israeli company. He's got these string of pearls, I call it, uh, ports which he controls. Now, uh, the question I'm adding here, you know, you talk about entrepreneur. And how much of, I mean, your meeting with him, you've described, uh, you went to Mundra and all that you saw. How much of Mr. Gautam Adani's rise, incredible rise as a business person, you can attribute to his entrepreneurial abilities and how much of it people say is due to his proximity to the Prime Minister of India, Mr. Narendra Modi. Uh, 
So I'm glad you, 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 I know, have an interest in Mr. Adani, um, and I'm glad you asked because few people do. I, I start the book with a chapter on uh, Mr. Ambani, a chapter on Mr. Malia, and a chapter on, on Mr. Adani. And he's the, to my mind, actually, he's almost the most interesting of the three because it's his rise that was the, the most dramatic. He, Malia and Adani, in, in, uh, sorry, uh, Malia and Ambani inherited their money. He did it all on his own. And as you have done more than um, anyone to, to chart, his rise was stunning in its scale. I, I mean, unprecedented. He went from almost nothing to being the 10th richest man in the country in a period of about seven years. Now, predominantly, I put that rise down to an incredibly aggressive approach to bank financing. I mean, he has the most jaw-dropping approach to the accumulation of debt and leverage. Um, I found it quite hard to find the truth of those like Mr. Rahul Gandhi who claim that some important proportion of his rise was due to favorable treatment from uh, the government of Gujarat under then Chief Minister Narendra Modi. Uh, there were and, and thereafter by the now, central government. Correct. Now, now Mr. Adani would deny that. Mr. Modi would deny that. that you know, there are particular cases that have some legal background to do with his port at Mundra and the special economic zone in particular. I, I, in the end, was not able, I think, to discover, maybe we'll have to wait for your book to discover the, the, the truth of this. Um, it is difficult to build large infrastructure projects of the sort that he has done in India without some sort of uh, favorable wind from the state. Um, now, there's a lot of gray area before you get into, is that kind of outright crony capitalism? And in the end, it was hard to tell. And so I tended to focus my story on the bit that you could look at, which is his relationships with the banks um, and the, the way that he was willing to take on debt and the kind of behavior. And, and then you go into some on. detail and talk about credit suites and how, you know, the house of debt. And right. So whether, uh, whether Adani um, is rightfully, I mean, I think it's clear that he's a skilled businessman. In almost all of these cases, these are not. Um, with due respect to African business, and I don't mean to be sort of pejorative about this, but this is not a, these are never situations in India, or almost never, in which you have people who are sort of simply friends of the politicians who are basically idiots, who get a concession. These are very skilled businessmen, and the question is, are they augmenting their ability as businessmen with favors to, to sort of do things that other people can't? But there's no question that Gautam Adani is, a, is an entrepreneur of some caliber. I mean, you, you can't do what he's done without actually being good at business. The question you're asking is, you know, did he get a kind of helping hand from his friends in politics? And that remains, I think, a kind of contested question. And that's one of the frustrations about India, that whether it was the question about the tycoons or something like the funding of political parties, Often, even if you spend a lot of time okay. sort of oh. burrowing around, right. you can't Let's get the Let's talk a little and, bit you know, about you know, this better uh, than anyone. economic systems in this country. You, I mean, it's not just a series of anecdotes. Your book is not just uh, a detailed accounts of these various business persons you met, Malia and Ambani, Adani, Naveen Jindal, among others. You also have sought to comment at some length on the economic systems. And... India's first prime minister wanted India to have a mixed economy, the best of capitalism, the best of socialism, whatever these words mean. Many could argue that we took the worst of all worlds. You know? <laughs> so instead of we had crony socialism once right. upon a time, now we have crony capitalism. And in a sense, uh, we emulated some of the worst practices from across the globe instead of you know, assimilating or adopting some of the best practices. So to what extent, I mean, I may not ideologically be on the same side as you, but you seem to be at different points of time ambivalent about what should have been the path that India did. I mean, yeah, we have a terrible record uh, of uh, healthcare in healthcare education infrastructure. Uh, and and it, what I found particularly interesting is that your book has been praised by two people who don't exactly see <laughs> eye to eye with each other. It's two of India's best known economists, Jagdish Bhagwati and Amartya Sen. And you seem to agree with both. So, so in a sense, you seem to be uh, performing a balancing act, I suppose a that, bit of this and a bit of that. I think that's a, that's a very fair criticism, but let me try and answer it this way. that it, Typically in India, 
there's this, I think, rather unhelpful debate where either you are a Jagdish Bhagwatiite and what you believe is a rising tide, risk, ri uh, rising tide lifts all boats and it doesn't matter if the super rich run away. What we care about is growth first, uh, reforms, and then other things will take care of themselves. And then on the other hand, you have Amartya Sen, the Nobel Prize winning economist, and his principal concern, although obviously Amartya, is, they're both very sophisticated thinkers, but his principal concern has been with the lot of the bottom. And he worries that despite India's uh, economic reforms, on measures, and the fact that lots of people have been lifted out of poverty, on measures of human development, India actually does much worse than Nepal or Bangladesh, no, notionally poorer countries. Now, I don't think this is a very helpful debate. I, I don't think, I, I am you know, in favor of the reforms that were introduced in 1991 broadly, and I have been quite critical of the government, of the preceding Congress government and Narendra Modi's government for not doing enough to do more reforms. But in the end, if you want to follow the path of East Asia, which is basically the best path that we know to bring millions of people out of poverty and build middle income and rich countries, um, they also introduced dramatic reforms, but they did it in a more inclusive way. And so I don't think that there is a contradiction uh, between wanting to be radical and reforming and you know, move hundreds of millions of people off agriculture and into cities and, and build a modern industrial economy. I think the efficient way that you do that is A, by bringing the people at the bottom along with you, which is what happened in East Asia, but also by worrying about rampant inequality. Now, okay. we have to be reasonable about what we're talking about here. You know, Thailand okay. and Malaysia Let are me, not Sweden. Let me just right. finish okay. this. Okay. Okay. These finish East it. Asian countries are not Sweden. They are unequal countries, they've got plenty of billionaires, but they're not as unequal as India was now, and they were much better at building basic systems of social support. So I, the debate between Amartya Sen and Jagdish Bhagwati, I think A, it misses the component of the importance of inequality as an issue. And I also think that in a sense, you can have the best of both worlds, and that's what happened in East Asia, which is that you have a more inclusive model of growth uh, that you, know, you can use the proceeds of growth more fairly to help those at the bottom. Okay. Yeah, sure. So I, I would go along with you, even though I'm not so sure how it can happen. You know, I would like to be optimistic about the future of this country. And I also at times sensed you an ambivalence on your part when you talked about Prime Minister Narendra Modi. At one point of time, you said, OK, he's trying to weed out corruption. But then you're also critical of him. And, and you say, no, I mean, no, no, not demonetization was, you know, um, not done. I mean, you, you've quoted from large numbers of people you met. I'll just give you here, uh, i just read out a paragraph. The risks of rising illiberalism should not be downplayed either, you say. The appeal of Hindu nationalism has grown in strength partly because of Modi himself, but also because of the thick sense of identity it provides in a country buffeted by the uncertainties of globalization. India's rising prosperity offers no special defense against this rise of a slippage into majoritarianism. Modi's Gujarat one of the country's richest and most industrialized states also suffers from one of its most wretched rec records of caste and communal harmony. So the question is that has India really, you know, in, in this whole era of Hindu nationalism, it's been more than four years since Narendra Modi has been in power, yet on the economic front, He's not been able to deliver to many extent. I mean, you could argue that demonetization had a major impact on the economy in terms of job creation, in terms of investments. So if I ask you now, how would, I mean, what, what is more important for you? Modi, the reformer, so-called economic reformer, again, you could argue in both ways, or here is this majoritarian, authoritarian, populist demagogue. Right. I have a great deal of respect for uh, um, Gucharan Das, who's uh, you know, a, a, an intellectual and interesting thinker. But on this, I, I don't particularly agree with him. He was one of the people who went public as saying that he was a liberal and he thought that the policies that Modi undertook were a, a sort of risk worth taking. And I would be more circumspect than that. I think that in a country like India, you have to be very, very wary of this majoritarian impulse. You have to remember where we began. I mean, the Congress government was a squalid mess, um, and so uh, things were so bad in the, at the end of the UPA that I, I understand why people were sort of desperate to try anything else. 
But I worry a lot about the majority. But the BJP got 31.4 percent of the vote. Well, correct. But that's the you only win under the electoral system that you have, right? So it's it's unfair to to criticize them. You know that that the way the system yeah, works. Sure. So. Um, I worry a lot about the majoritarian impulse of the Hindu nationalists. Um, the example of Gujarat is a, is a good one because I consider myself to be a liberal in the British sense of the word. Um, and you want to believe that, in a sense, kind of nice liberal politics and economic growth go together. But the case of Gujarat shows that that's not the case. It's not necessarily true um, that you know having liberal rights and respecting minorities uh, will necessarily be the best kind of growth enhancing policy. But I think there are good reasons to believe that that is the case and that particularly in a country that has, you know, sort of 20% of its population are minorities, um, that the values that are written in India's constitution are the best, not simply from a moral point of view about the, the dignity and worth of all of the people who live in this country, but from an economic point of view as well. That if you want to attract foreign investment, if you want social stability of the sort that will allow the economy to grow, that it would be very risky to go down the kind of path of effectively turning India into a Hindu Pakistan, which I think, although I don't think, yeah, I'm, I don't I'm, think, I'm, I'm, the, the I don't Sanghis think, won't like it because when. Shashi Tharoor made, made that same analogy. He was very, very badly right. attacked. But, but the problem is that, I mean, the problem is that the secular tradition, which is the one that I, as a, an outsider, a, a Westerner, a liberal, I look at the Indian constitution, I see a lot to like in that, in that document if it were to be properly implemented. But the problem is that the, the, this point, the quote you um, read, was, was that line was carefully written, the thick sense of identity. Why is it that all across North India, 20, 25 year old men turn to Narendra Modi, they see something that they like, they see a source of strength and identity. They don't see that in the secular tradition. The secular tradition looks weak, corrupt, divided. It's embodied at the moment by Rahul Gandhi, who, although he may have a second act, is showing no signs of, of quite getting okay. there. But this is the point, that in the end, the secular tradition in India is is in deep trouble and, and needs to be reinvented. And, and here you're not talking as that, bleeding heart foreigner who's outraged by the inequality, the gap between the rich and the poor. But uh, you see yourself as a well-wisher of this country and you believe that this kind of Hindu nationalism, majoritarianism is going to harm Indian society and harm India's economy. And, and as we speak, you know, uh, elections are not that far away. And uh, if I ask you to just sort of put on your <laughs> thinking cap, gaze at the crystal ball. I mean, how do you see the next eight months or ten well, months this is run a, up to the election? I think this is an interesting question for, for Indian liberals. So this, this sort of rump of the, the kind of secular elite who've been on the back foot for, for 10 years, 20 years now, because they fear that Modi is going to turn himself into an Erdogan figure, that somehow he's going to try and become a, a kind of quasi-dictator. My reading is rather different, actually, that I think the, what's going to happen is Modi will return because he's overwhelmingly popular amongst the people. The opposition is hopeless. And although you may not like his record in government, I think most people think he's done all right. He seems to be a strong leader. He speaks well in public, kind of looks like a good politician. The data suggests he has a 70% approval rating, which is stunning. But, but once again... But, but, no, again, but, but, but here, let me finish yeah, the point. Okay. The point is that it's very difficult to imagine I, I suspect he'll come back with a reduced majority, or perhaps if, if they do badly, um, then he'll have to go into a coalition. And that will mean that instead of getting Modi the demagogue, you'll get Modi but sort of slightly weaker. Um, More chastened? Uh, Bigger pardon? Well, potentially chastened, less but, authoritarian? but just less able. Well, I don't know about less authoritarian. The question, the, here's the risk. The risk is that the majoritarian impulse is a choice. Now, we know that when elections come around, the BJP and its particularly its far right acolytes have a choice about do they throw some red meat out to the base and then we all start talking about love jihad or whatever it might be. And the risk is that if Modi perceives that his authority on the economy is slipping, do he and those around him decide to whip up other sources of support? Now that, that's the nasty scenario. 
uh, let's imagine that doesn't happen, then in a sense what's going to probably happen is that you'll get a Modi that was quite like this Modi, but just less good, because he won't have a majority in Parliament and he'll be able to get less done. And so instead of a kind of an all-powerful demagogue, what you will have is a Modi who's less powerful and less able to get things done. That right. I think is the most likely okay. outcome. Uh, time alone can tell. None of us can predict the future. Um, we'll wait and watch and see what happens. Thank you so much, James, for giving me your time. And... Uh, for holding forth about why you've written this book if you, uh, that you have and your concerns about the way India is moving. And you've just heard and watched James Crabtree, journalist, professor, who's written this book, The Billionaire Raj, A Journey Through India's New Gilded Age. Thank you for being with us and keep watching News Click.